Hi, I'm Natalie from the New Center. I, I started as a certificate student at the New Center in art and curatorial practice and occasionally organize manifestations of our events. I'm here with Lucia Pietrolusi, who is the curator of the Lithuanian Pavilion here at the fifteenth edition of the Venice Biennale, and she is also the uh, curator of General Ecology at Serpentine Gallery. Maybe Lucia, you can introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your practice in London and in Venice and abroad. Of course, hi. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm curator of General Ecology at the Serpentine Gallery in London. That is a uh, relatively new position, uh, and the aim of it is to embed ecological principles in the widest possible sense of the words from species extinction, extinction pardon, all the way through to plant intelligence and forms of mysticism uh, into all of the programming that we do and the way that we do it. So doing ecology through ecology, so that manifests itself through live events and uh, publications and radio through me, so it's a big and beautiful, uh, actually sometimes quite troubling task, troubling task, I imagine. And um, you're here curating what our newspaper, I believe, called one of the weirdest pavilions at the Venice Biennale. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think it's a weird, so weird. pavilion? <laughs> and I love weird, so I want to talk about that. I have to say that was one of my favorite um, Compliments, I guess I'll take it as a compliment. So the Lithuanian Pavilion this year is a uh, collaborative opera performance by three uh, practitioners, Rugile Barzukaite, uh, Baiba Grenite, and Bina Lapulite. Rugile is a theater and film director, Baiba is a writer and a poet, and Bina is a visual artist and composer. And it comes together um, as uh, a piece called Sun and Sea Marina, which is a completely uh, readapted uh, piece of an opera that they composed last year, uh, durational, so it will be on from 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock the whole of this week. Uh, and San Enzi Marina is, uh, takes place on an artificially lit indoor beach, which you watch from a mezzanine, so it's an incredibly stunning and again incredibly weird sort of alienating place to be in order to see an opera, but also to just to see that kind of scenes. It, it's, it feels incredibly natural, you have kids there, dogs there sometimes, you just have a kind of flow of people as though it were a real beach. And the being that it is an opera, it is all sung by some, it's a series of songs, and they are the sort of thoughts and everyday life and musings and worries of people on the beach, as you might expect them to be. But underneath, kind of over the course of the opera, which is a one hour loop, you kind of get a sense of a growing anxiety around climate change issues. So, uh, jellyfish dancing, swirling around plastic bags volcanic ash clouds delaying flights, but as they manifest through the kinds of everyday lives of people. So it's an opera that tries to address incredibly serious and worrying material, but with a relative ease and uh, the frivolity of a kind of day at the beach. That's fantastic. I look so forward to seeing it. I hope you can come. Yes, soon. absolutely. Um, how, how, what is your relationship to the city of Venice and how, how did you come here, essentially? So sort of what did you anticipate for working in Venice, such a difficult logistic city to get around, first of all, and to produce something as incredible as an art project on a beach and outside of a beach and within pavilions. It's very difficult to produce the most important international art biennial in a place like this, and that's what makes it so fascinating. What was, what are your views or what was your approach? It's difficult, and from the point of view of sustainability, it also raises some really important questions, mm -hmm. in, even simply at the level of the materials that are brought in for the Biennale and whether they then have a future life. There are several cooperatives and organizations that work within Venice to recycle those materials and make them available to art students and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it is, you know, as all Biennales are, it's a parachuted event into the city. And so one of the works that we really wanted to do uh, with this pavilion was to work a little bit more uh, embedded in the city. And that happened in two ways, three ways primarily. One of them we have, uh, yes, a Lithuanian cast who is taking us off, and then an Italian cast that will take over, mostly based in Venice. Um, secondly, we uh, the pavilion is located inside the military zone of the Arsenale, so a restricted zone that has never been open to the public before. So you have, uh, what we've noticed yesterday was we had an enormous amount of locals that came to see it, even just to see this part of Venice that they'd never seen before, and they live two doors down. 
So that was the kind of work that we wanted to do. And thirdly, the catalog was also a way uh, for us to work with and within the territory. So it's designed by the collective Abake, Obeke, and uh, it's a vinyl and catalog kind of combo, mm. which is both printed and then screen printed. And the printing was done at uh, Grafike Venetiana, which is the only uh, uh, lithographic printers in, on the islands of Venice. And the screen printing was then done by a cooperative run by uh, Mel Inman, mates of the prison of Santa Maria Maggiore. Wow. So the physical transport of these vinyls from one place to the other and the connection between these two organizations was something that Benjamin from Obike was very keen on uh, making happen. And so the hope is that the publication is a catalyst for further series of collaborations that we are not currently able to do. That's incredible. Uh, aspiring curators take note. <laughs> These are really good ways of reducing just all sorts of, sort of ecological and economic concerns and costs in engaging society as well. Um, I have to say that it's really the, all of these uh, initiatives were really the product of many voices and many knowledges. Benjamin mm -hmm. Reichen, for example, from Obika has an incredibly deep knowledge of the city of Venice. So it's more, it's less about having good ideas and more about listening to the good ideas. Absolutely, and listening to, to the, the people who know the city from the inside. As we were just saying the other day, to be able to navigate Venice as a tourist, I mean, you have to have at least 10 years living here. And <laughs> the people, Venetians, who know the city so well, it's because they're born with an internal map inside their head. Mm -hmm. That's true. A way of navigating it. And the good and bad things about Google Maps, because Google Maps works much better at Biennale by Biennale in Venice. It oh. didn't used to, say, in 2011. Okay. I got lost just around here. But uh, you now follow Google Maps, and it kind of gets you there, but you stop looking at the city. So there was a kind of joy in getting yeah. lost. There was a joy in getting lost. Absolutely. That's strange. What were some Biennales that you've seen, that, or projects within Biennales that you've seen that have really interested you or have really stuck with you, not only in Venice, but perhaps in other contexts or over time? How have you seen Biennales in general evolve? Oh gosh, well, it's, it's a really, really interesting question that I'm afraid I'm uh, going to fail terribly at men mentioning because there's just so much to mention. I am not uh, a person who disagrees with the existence of the uh, There is an enormous amount of uh, key cultural work that happens when Biennale kind of sprout up. We don't have to call them that, but it's essentially cultural work in cities. And I find that to be an incredibly sort of important thing. I mean, I guess most recently, Manifesta in Palermo was uh, awe-inspiring. Mm mostly because of the ways in which it interlaced sort of political, human political and ecological political concerns mm -hmm. as being one and the same, which they are. And in the way that it, of course, opened uh, beautiful buildings in Palermo and the city that, uh, that, you know, it opened these beautiful places that the city had not uh, given access to before. So a kind of ecological, I could, would consider that to be a kind of ecological work, also as a methodology, which is what I'm really interested in. Both the Lithuanian within and the city. Where would you love to see a biennial takes place, for example, for Manifesta? We, we learned that um, uh, Kosovo, Pristina, Pristina mm -hmm. is the next Manifesta destination. Mm -hmm. um, but where, what, what is one city where you would love? to see a large scale exhibition open up the city from the inside that you've encountered on your travels or working with artists from there. Gosh. I'm trying to think, but I think every city I've probably every been city. to has a Biennale <laughs> already. I, and I, you know, and I would love to be able to say something lovely and poetic, like in the middle of the sea, but mm. ecologically speaking, that is just not the right thing to do. I like the notion of distributed biennales, things that happen over a course of a long period of time, such as Bergen Assembly, for example. And it's perhaps a little bit more of that that I would love to see. And the where is, you know, it's up to the, it's up to wherever it wants it, really. I, I feel like it should really come from the inside. And Absolutely. What are you most looking forward to when, when this show is open? 
when this when your show is open when the, your pavilion is the open. pavilion yeah. it's open come. it's open yes. it's come oh yes. my gosh 10 o'clock to 7 we have singers all day every day <gasps> until the end of the week yes That's please good. join us we'll come we'll take footage but Thank what you. was i looking the most forward to i guess um i guess the weirdness of seeing it live i've seen it and heard it a thousand times a thousand times in the last year and there is nothing like seeing it in person that sounds fantastic Thank you so much, Lucia. Thank you so much. Pleasure.